going to the standard discussion on the decision of the Supreme Court of India's decision uh, in PSL Wind Solutions Private Limited versus GE Power Conversion Private Limited, where the Apex Court recently settled the much debated question on whether two pa Indian parties can choose a foreign seat of arbitration or not. My name is Tushar Behel, along with my colleague Ridul Gupta. We both are pursuing the dispute resolution pathway of the Daksha Fellowship. The Daksha Fellowship is India's first law policy and business fellowship program for young and mid-career lawyers, public policy professionals, and other graduates with a background in law. The fellowship is a one-year program with a contemporary curriculum formulated by international renowned faculty in collaboration with leading practitioners and industry experts. The fellowship curriculum designs facilitates fellows in advancing beyond policy and legal framework to understand technology, business practices, and communication in the digital age. It is a great pleasure for me to have this conversation and will welcome Mr. Arthur Kurlekar, who happens to be our Professor of International Commercial Arbitration at the Daksha Fellowship. Arthur is an alumnus of the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. And on graduation from NUJS, he pursued his Bachelor from Civil Law from Radium College, University of Oxford and further his Master's in International Dispute Settlement from CIDS Geneva. He is currently working in Geneva as an associate at Curtis Mallet Prevost Colt and Mosley LLP in their International Arbitration and Public International Law Group. Uh, prior to this, Arthur has worked at the Permanent Court of Arbitration as an assistant legal counsel. His work primarily involves around representing states and state-owned entities and in, in international disputes. Arthur's experience includes both investor state arbitration and international commercial arbitration before many fora, including the ICSID, the ICC, and the PCA. His areas of focus include international law, public international law, international trade law, law of the sea, law of international organizations, and international sanctions. We are honored to have you today with us, Arthur. So today's discussion uh, would revolve around a welcome development in the dispute resolution landscape in India, the much debated question on whether two Indian parties may choose a foreign seat of arbitration or not. Despite the considerable improvement in the dispute resolution landscape in India, with credit to many pro-arbitration judgments of the Indian judiciary, parties to Indian transactions are likely to favor international seats over an Indian seat. This may be for a number of reasons, a primary being to avoid the delays that plague the Indian court system. However, this judgment also raises a set of thought-provoking questions. And I hand over, to Flo, uh, hand over the floor to Arthur to express his quick thoughts on the PSL judgment. And over uh, after that, we would get to discussing some of our questions in detail. Over to you, Arthur. Uh, thank you, Tushar. The judgment, in summary, uh, as Tushar said, speaks about whether two parties can two Indian parties can agree to a seat outside of India? And the short answer to the question is yes. And in doing so, the court looks at several considerations, primarily the construction of the Arbitration Act and whether part one and part two of the Indian Arbitration Act are watertight uh, you know, compartments in themselves or whether there's some sort of uh, transposition from one to the other. And the court looks at issues of public policy. And um, I hope to address these later in the conversation. Before we get into the detailed discussion of uh, the judgment, the first question that comes to my mind is regarding party autonomy. Now, the whole judgment has something to do with the party autonomy. Right? Now, party autonomy, how will this party autonomy will be protected in the case whereby one party to the transaction goes and gets an anti-suit arm, anti-arbitration anti injunction. Now, how the courts will protect that? We can start the discussion here and then we can take this forward. Um, thank you for the question. So, with respect to an anti-arbitration injunction, the question has to be looked at from a broader light. How do you express party autonomy? In a dispute resolution clause, you would have typically agreed to a specific forum, correct? And then um, whether this forum is exclusive or non-exclusive is one such consideration. Whether this forum is a court or an arbitration is another such um, consideration. So, for example, in a foreign contract, if two parties agree that um, the courts of a foreign state will have jurisdiction. That is equally an expression of the party's autonomy 
as much as it is in agreeing to an arbitration clause now several countries have different approaches to anti arbitration injunctions so scholars suggest uh, there's somewhat of a divide between civil law and common law countries on how anti arbitration injunctions are viewed and the corollary of which you mentioned briefly is also anti suit injunctions so when you have uh, an injunction which you ask for in support of an arbitration it would be an anti suit injunction and so they go hand in hand and to consider english jurisprudence on the point in the sense where the parties have agreed to settle their disputes by reference to a particular forum um and i'm not saying just arbitration be it court or be it arbitration the question arises as to whether this agreement can be enforced and if this is an exclusive choice such as in case of an arbitration agreement english courts have held that a party has the right to enforce this choice of forum be it a court or be it arbitration of course there are exceptional situations um but where the choice is non exclusive other considerations such as for example whether the filing has been done in a vexatious or oppressive manner um or forum non convenience and matters such as that come into play and this view is consistent with the idea that the party's choice must be res- respected and enforced and party's choice here could be for arbitration or could be for a court um to have a particular jurisdiction and this is on point on uh, on the point of uh, how english courts view this and scholars suggest civil law strikes a different balance um of course the caveat that there are jurisdictional nuances even in civil law jurisdictions but and i'm merely attempting a simplistic generalization of it but the european court of justice has held for example that a court granting an anti suit injunction against another court does not sit well with the principle of comity potentially while the issue of comity between courts of national jurisdictions would not arise for an anti arbitration injunction prior practice suggests that courts may not favor granting an arbitration an anti arbitration injunction so this favors the idea of competence competence or that the tribunal has the power to decide on its jo- own jurisdiction so as you can see there are different ways in which you can strike a balance between freedom of contract and uh issues of public policy or issues of party autonomy and um how it is viewed and ultimately this this goes to something which uh, justice nariman mentioned in the judgment so after reviewing several issues on public policy he says that the exercise to determine if a provision is repugnant to public policy is ultimately a balance between the freedom to contract and public harm so how how and to what extent do you protect a uh, party's autonomy is also a question of this balance and how the court views it thank you so much for that now next question is what will be the implications of this judgment in india well implications is a broad term and um it's it's a bit of a guess here because you never know how particular judgment might be received but uh, we have to consider the impact of any judgment from um, on arbitration from the viewpoint of all as users so parties institutions and you know generally what we call uh, in indian arbitration um the community as as arbitral climate and whether it's pro arbitration or anti arbitration and, and matter such as that so from that perspective i think this judgment makes the whole environment a little more competitive because now the parties have a clear option to choose foreign seats this has opened up a market for other institutions as well to compete in the indian sphere and this will compel institutions to innovate but having said that there are other considerations as well because um, as you know cost and convenience and there are several other factors which go into choosing uh, a seat of arbitration and you know there are many studies some by the queen mary university which have gone on to describe these features so it's not a defined uh, or a preset thing that this will have a uh, either a huge impact or none impact at all but we will have to see how 
industry users receive this judgment from that perspective but uh, to to sum up my view is that this will certainly help make uh, innovations or new developments or case management of a more productive in in an institution another question we have is basically on the prolifer- proliferation of such clauses being drafted these kind of dispute resolution clauses so do you have any any views any thoughts on how a dispute resolution clause of this kind might be tilted or for instance how should what considerations should be kept in mind while you know drafting these dispute resolution clauses that's a good question and for proliferation it is it goes hand in hand with your question of the impact of the judgment and if you consider the judgment to have a huge impact um of course you would arrive at the conclusion that there could be a proliferation of this and but but to go into further details i think the facts of the case are quite determinative of this particular situation if you go through the judgment you realize that one of the parties was 99% owned by a french parent and then the french parent was in turn owned by a us parent so from a business standpoint not a legal standpoint but from a business standpoint there was certainly a foreign element involved in it it wasn't as though indian nationals who own an indian company a small business um, have opted for a seat outside of india and that i think does play a role practically speaking in the drafting of such clauses as well so for ex- in entering these contracts who has the decision making power to decide what sort of dispute resolution clauses you would enter into if it's the general counsel what say does he have in the parent company what say does he or she have in in a in a uh, in the subsidiary company and that all will play a role in deciding um whether these clauses are adopted or not right uh, thanks a lot for that uh, another question that pops up in this case is as you would have seen in the judgment uh, that we see a very liberal interpretation of the indian contract act and the arbitration and conciliation act uh, there are questions of public policy as well and basically my question revolves around how such interpretation of all these three terms the contract act the arbitration of course the public policy how do these impact the commercial arbitration environment in india right so the assumption again the starting point of the question is that it is a liberal interpretation right it's not just another interpretation but it's a liberal interpretation so one has to bear in mind that it may not necessarily be a liberal interpretation of particular statutes but just plain old statutory interpretation which the court has done and it seems to be the case for example where the court is relying on the exception um in section 28 of the contract act where they say that arbitration should not affect policy and then in turn looking at the many decisions on public policy from english jurisprudence and even in indian jurisprudence the court arrives at a conclusion that that should not affect the choice of seat and the court also leaves the option open without making a decision on it leaves the option open that if substantive law issues arise and fundamental policy is affected a party will still have some sort of recourse against that and so what the court has done is to strike again a very delicate balance between ensuring that certain fundamental principles which do apply uh, or which of indian law which would apply um should or be be considered by the tribunal while at the same time ensuring that parties have the advantage of um having their choice enforced a choice of a foreign seat enforced and as far as public policy interpretation goes that is evident in terms of the different amendments the law commission reports that have come out and the judgments which are coming out on this matter that Uh, the broader interpretation of public policy is fading away for a more um, narrow sort of understanding of it and while the court seems to support this narrow viewpoint which is emerging uh, 
um that doesn't necessarily translate to a liberal interpretation of the contract or the arbitration acts so i i, I do believe that it is a it is a well reasoned decision certainly but it is an exercise in statutory interpretation which the court has engaged in without terming it as liberal or strict in one way or the other right uh, so yeah uh, one of my questions uh, arises from your very point on the amendments that have been brought to the arbitration and conciliation act this question actually links to a very broader question of india becoming a hub of international arbitration so a reason why even a pro enforcement indian judiciary is not seen as such in india is because of the time taken in enforcing foreign awards in india uh, we have the example of centro trade case where actually an award in 2001 was finally enforced after 19 years in 2020 so while the recent developments in indian arbitration uh, point towards a consistent enforcement of foreign awards it is urgent for the judiciary and legislature to actually work together to ensure that foreign awards are not only enforced but enforced within a reasonable time we also have the issues concerning in, uh, enforcement of investment arbitration awards we where we have considerations like the commercial reservation made to the new york convention by india so my question to you is basically uh, are there any modifications according to you as per your opinion that india should make if any when it comes to the enforcement mechanism of foreign awards in india's judgment well the problems which you highlighted uh, many of those are practical issues of implementation what what the court has done here is to look at the statutory regime which applies to the enforcement of foreign awards now as far as commercial arbitration is concerned that regime as per the court's decision is coherent and it is consistent and you can interpret foreign awards in a manner uh, which is in accordance with the new york convention and to, so if the question is do we require modifications in the statutory language the answer is um, not at this point certainly not in accordance with how the court reads uh, the provisions of the foreign award and that's where the court goes into the discussion between how the regime used to apply when the geneva convention was applicable versus how the regime applies now uh, that the arbitration act enforces the new york convention and the court arrives at the conclusion that uh, the provisions of the new york convention are sustainably enforced through the arbitration act um and 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 so in that sense no i would say uh from a statutory standpoint the other point from a policy perspective one could one could say that uh, there have been several amendments in the past in the past few years establishing and the Im- est- establishing what scholars have termed as a pro arbitration regime um many people have written about it in india as well and it it however takes some time to establish that sort of regime any regulatory change which is uh which is made the impact of it is seen in a in a few years or after some time passes and therefore it is for us to wait and see also without tweaking too many things at the same time to see what impact the past changes have made and whether we need to make any further modifications um going into the future right that's that's very helpful uh i'll switch over to umradul here i'll pass pass on the stage in the time the discussion that we are having uh, it, it brings out a lot of insights as to the framework and how the courts interpreted the particular dispute resolution clause etc but i want to expand this discussion and bring in the question of whether we should allow to indian parties to substantive law to have their disputes resolved in india where the business is in india the parties are indian in few aspects whether we should give them this choice of choosing substantive law and what viability will it be how viable it will be so i want to have a discussion on that whether has been a debated question and it is um well it's an issue which many states seem to be grappling with and ultimately the position is each state has to choose uh, 
on its own policy on um, how far it will regulate um, its own nationals in terms of the freedoms of contract that that are afforded um conflict of law rules may also play a role in terms of which law would govern whether the parties have a right to to choose such matters or not so that's a balance which each state has to strike for its own and ultimately as the court says in the judgment it is an exercise it's a balance it's a policy balance between freedom of contract and public harm and it's it's difficult to say really whether this should be allowed or whether this shouldn't be allowed because there are clear advantages as we see from this judgment and as we see from the reception of this judgment by many scholars and practitioners in the indian community of having um, this option and of course there are other high court judgments which uh, which have been discussed in the case where this was considered as something of an issue to public policy in india and so uh, those were also well reasoned decisions of the court so there are clear advantages and disadvantages in allowing or disallowing parties to choose that and this is something um which goes together with how india sees itself as an arbitrary uh, arbitral hub and to what extent it regards arbitration as a viable mechanism and so on thank you sir i have uh, one more thing coming to my mind from this discussion so what will this particular thing this interpretation and this proliferation etc whatever we have to discuss what will it mean for dispute resolution scenario in india like will it be at par with other countries or it's just a matter of time that we need to see and and judge for itself well i think it's it's a matter of time whether this judgment is certainly uh, one which was well received as we know it was and there have been very few criticisms of the judgment more scholars more practitioners have praised this judgment and so it seems that the majority opinion here is that the judgment is progressive uh, in nature but as i said any any change in the regulation or any clarification of uh, a particular provision or of policy requires some gestation period to see whether uh and how these these are affected and so um i suppose it's for time to tell us whether this is uh an effective um judgment or helpful in to the arbitral climate in india excellent that was a lovely discussion you know the discussion got for a lot of insights we unpacked a lot of things from the judgment with the progressive judgment like this one could change a lot of things for arbitration things like enforcement mechanisms changes in drafting of the agreements and the like it was a pleasure being present in this discussion i would like to thank arthur for taking the time out from his busy schedule and giving us the insights from the judgment i would also like to thank daksha fellowship for organizing this discussion and i would like to especially thank mr chitran narayan our program head mr mahesh menon faculty raksha fellowship and mr prashant bhai thank you everyone for tuning in thank you so much